basically. Good morning tomorrow, so and welcome. <laughs> um, I see not everyone has their headphones on. That's okay, you don't have to. Uh, but I certainly am very excited that there are headphones this year. Uh, because of, like right now, we don't have maximum capacity. But as the days go by, you may not, even though you, I'm speaking through a mic, it's, it could still be challenging. So the headphones is an additional way that you can hear all of us more clearly, despite uh, being in an environment with competing sounds. Welcome uh, to this very interesting and very important session around the role of film and television schools in uplifting education. We're so lucky today to have a very exciting panel my name is Meganthri Pillay, and contrary to what it's, oh, they got it, Masala Filmworks. <laughs> they actually have the right uh, company name. Uh, I'm also with the IBFC and the co-chair of the DFMI. I've been in training and mentorship for many years. Um, and education, closing the gaps in the film and television education has been a major driving force and passion. Um, today, we have with us on our, uh, just help, I'm just orientating myself, on my <coughs> left, <laughs> your right, uh, is Tamara DeWitt, creative producer and strategist for Gobez Media. Uh, all the way from Canada, and I'm sure she will have many exciting contributions to this conversation. Uh, and if I can, please do a short summary as well of who you are, and then we'll jump into the conversation. We have Lamise Inglis. I I'm jumping around here. Lamise um, is the managing director for a very exciting and innovative training program uh, that operates uh, pretty nationally, but principally in the Western Cape. Ikasi Creative Media. Diane <laughs> Lawrenson is the Dean of the Cape Town Campus for AFTA. Um, AFTA, as many of you know, is also a national organization and has been uh, in the forefront of film and television education. Um, we are missing uh, Ciswear, but if he does show up, We'll be so excited for him to join the conversation, but as it stands, he's not with us. So, can I just ask all of you? You have to introduce me. Oh, I'm so sorry, Uga. Thank you. <laughs> and last, but not, but least. not least, <laughs> is the very formidable um, and brave filmmaker Uga Carlini, who's the president of Tower Corp Creations. Uh, Uga works in both documentary and fiction uh, and has done a lot of master classes for multiple training institutions. And so that's also exciting, working in film as a practitioner and going into institutions. And uh, for many of us who have been on the journey for a while to see the transitions uh, and everything that is the developments uh, and where we, where we come from and where we are. Um, maybe we can jump, as you were last, Uga, maybe you can kick off this conversation, uh, introducing yourself and then just talking about where we come from in terms of te film and television education. Okay, so um, hello, I'm Uga, as you heard, and my company, Twilver Corp Creations, has been specializing in female-driven heroine stories since 2010. And I think what's for me really interesting about this panel is my generation didn't have the film schools that's out there now. There was Pretoria Tech, and I was Cape Town based. I had to go to Stellenbosch. My mum worked for them. I could go for free, which is a big gift. Yes, I know. But we sort of had to figure it out as we went along. But what I can state without a doubt in my mind, is the more tools you have in your bag, the more you'll have as a filmmaker to, to, to pull from. And there's a lot of way to get these tools, and obviously you're gonna hear from some incredible women here with me on this panel about the, the tools that are available now. But I definitely wanna touch on 
What happens when the tools are not there or you can't go to the film school? What can we do then? Because I have good news, there's a lot you can do. <laughs> and I am the proof. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's jump to Lamise. Um, hello everyone, so I'm, I'm Lamise and I'm from Ikasi Creative. Ikasi Creative focuses on rural communities and small town youth, unemployed youth between 18 and 35. We train film and television as well as digital media. Um, the reason why we started was because these towns are very picturesque and um, film production companies like to use picturesque towns for their locations. However, as filmmakers, we're very concerned about being eco-friendly and our green footprint. But what happens to educating the youth of those towns? So mm. that's sort of where we come in. We work out in the small towns. We train them in production. So if a production comes into the area, they are able to get uh, an entry-level position on that production. And furthermore, we train digital media and social media content creation because obviously they need to earn a living when productions aren't around. Yeah, so that's Ikasi Creative. We're at stand E19, if you need to know more. Um, let's stay in South Africa before we jump overseas. Dian? Thanks, hi, my name is Dian. I started my career as an actress in South Africa, which is really hard. And then I started producing content producer, mainly for TV and a little bit of film. And for almost the last five years, I've been dean of the AFTA Cape Town campus. Uh, before we move on, just tell us a little bit about uh, the core areas that AFTA deals with, perhaps. Core areas? Core. Wow. I know it's multiple, but <laughs> go ahead. Summary. So, so AFTA has actually many areas of study. We've got motion picture, we've got television, we've got live performance, we even have a BCom school, we've got a music um, performance school, we've got about 11 programs in Cape Town, that's high certificate, undergrad, postgraduate, we've got more than 33 disciplines that we teach in motion picture alone. Then we have about five areas of speciality in live performance. So there's a lot. I mean, the conversation really is about what level of education you want to do, where you want to go to in terms of tertiary studies, or how far you can go, because it's not always possible for everyone to do it all. So when you come to after, the trajectory is either a year and into industry, or three, four, five years. Thank you. Tamara. Mm. Uh, tell us just a little bit about your background and some of the work that you do? Sure, I mean, um, I started my career in international development over 20 years ago, and it actually, now that I'm thinking about it through this panel, it was really rooted in training. I worked on programs across the continent of Africa and in the Caribbean, um, training and empowering young people and children to produce journalistic content, radio shows, uh, photography, music, and short films. Um, out of that, I transitioned into working in funding agencies, um, both in the screen sector in Canada as well in the music industry, funding and designing, training and export programs. Um, I've stepped back from that because I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I've been a producer for many years. I produce East African content, both in Canada and in Ethiopia. Um, but it's really important for me as a producer, I spend about half of my time in the year training. And it's a political decision. Um, you know, I didn't have an opportunity in Canada to, to go to film school. Everything I learned was through events like this, through labs, it was trial by fire. And I know that when I look behind me at, at the next generation in Ethiopia, in East Africa, in Canada, if I don't go back and teach, there aren't gonna be people who look like me who are telling stories from my communities who, who know how to do that. So that's really what drives me now. And I, I train in Canada, um, and I also trained for a program in East Africa. Um, can you just a little bit more on what kind of training? Like, is it more generic? Is it specific areas by discipline? What would you say is the key areas of training? 
Yeah, um, in Canada, a lot of the work that I do is focused on producers because it was really identified that there was a, a deficit of um, black, indigenous, and person of color producers who were compared, prepared to manage slates, prepared to lead companies, prepared to come to events like this and take part in international co-productions. So that's very much with a business focus. Um, in East Africa, we're a coalition of screen agencies that work together because we feel that there's no need for us to be competing against each other in the region. And we also want to inspire regional co-production. So we really assessed what was happening and where the needs were. So we have in, in Kenya the Great Lakes program, which looks at producers. And then the main program I work on is for writers and directors. And it's focused on development. Um, and that happens in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania with um, Deutsche Welle Academy. And that's also, you know, has a political backbone to it because we knew that stories from our region are being extracted and we wanted to empower the writers and directors to, to tell their own stories and to give them also the time and the space to, to nurture and develop them. Fantastic. Very exciting. Let's just jump back to uh, Lemis and Ikasi Media because you're doing very similar work. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what impact has the training you've been doing, have, what impact has it, has it been having on those communities? And maybe just talk a little bit about where those communities are, because I think, uh, you know, it's easy to be in, well, it's not easy to be anywhere, <laughs> but to be in areas outside of the main cities. Um, yeah, I think you have particular challenges, but also opportunities. Maybe just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so definitely there are quite a few unique challenges that we as a training provider um, encounter where other training providers might not encounter this. Um, just the sheer distance where our students would live as opposed to where the classes are, that's always a big challenge. The other challenge might be um, the impoverished areas that they come from and the the psychological um, challenges that they face in their home lives. Um, we try and utilize that um, for storytelling though. So that's sort of how we nurture and try and um, encourage um, speaking and therapy in that way. Um, so we've started out in the garden route. We've trained in the West Coast, various areas like Ribikale, Feldriff in the West Coast. We worked out in the Wooster area in Drakenstein and in the Cape Flats here in Cape Town. Um, we've got two very exciting boot camps that's happening um, at the end of September, and that is an all-female boot camp um, with 30 delegates from Atlantis and then 30 female delegates from Ocean View and the Cape Flats area. We are accredited by the MICT CETA, so we can offer full qualification as well, yeah. Fantastic. <coughs> um, what would you say are some of the insights um, working within this field uh, you can share around the impact of film education? Even if, even if people don't become filmmakers, although Obviously, with a lot of the training, people go into that field. What, what are some of the insights you can share in terms of the impact that this education has had on them personally? Yeah, I mean, look, from a personal perspective, I know that it is vital that we encourage our students to tell their own stories. So, doesn't really matter where the students are coming from in terms of demographics, places where they live, social stature. We have to encourage our youth to participate in transformative nation building. We have to ensure that they are telling South African stories for a South African market and the rest. But we have to start here. When I was younger, the focus was always global. We had to mimic, we were pretending to be American. You know, there were a lot of things that we were doing to, to try and achieve good content. And it's, it's exciting to see that we are now creating creative economies in South Africa, driving content, 
that is absolutely local. And that's the only way we can build sustainable economies, right? That's what we want to do. We want to have the youth create business for themselves, for their peers. And that business obviously extends into other areas like tourism and service providers and all those kind of things. So just from experience, when I was a younger actress, one of my mentors said to me, you'll never be able to act if you can't get rid of your Afrikaans accent. <laughs> 25 years later, I'm still acting. And I still can't say there. So, <laughs> so it's, it's important to stay close to our narratives. And of course, we don't want to be in a single, singular narrative. We want to be part of being South African. But for me, anyway, being part and being a dean for five years, I suppose that's the only thing we can teach the youth, is just to use the tools you have and tell the stories that are necessary to tell. Speaking of tools, I see you are <laughs> wanting to jump in. What are the kinds of tools you need to tell those stories? You know, I think um, there's two things that I was like, I want to say. So what I want to say is there is no rules when it comes to tools. But the more tools you have, the better a chance you have to do what you need to do because the competition is tough. And especially in youth, there's a lot of people that want to tell films and have the energy to do so because it's, it's, it's a hell of a thing. If you think, I've made three films, I've been blessed that they all got worldwide distribution. Please watch the next one on the 6th of October on Amazon <laughs> about the world's most trusted UFO story beyond the light barrier. But it took years. 13 years is what it took to finish this one. And it was the tools that I kept gathering. And um, you said, and I love that, that you know, I didn't have film school. I had bits of film in the degree I got offered. And thank you to my degree. I studied acting, and we could do film in our last year. But I mean, not like AFCA does film or any of the other great institutions that are now out there. But it's events like these that there's a lot of ways to do it. Guild, the, the Writers Guild, SWIFT, Females in Film, the DFA, the Independent Producers Organization, just join everything, sign up for every newsletter, because there is no rules. But if you can get education in your craft, of course you're gonna have a tool that is solid. You're gonna have the, like the MICAS one, versus the one you had to pick up at the Musenberg market. Yeah. Love the Musenberg market, but you know what I mean. That's like a cool market, by the way. <laughs> um, but the point is, not once in my life has anyone asked me, where did you study? Can I see your degree? Can I see your bag of tools? They go, show me, sh show me. Do you see what I'm saying? But I could do that with confidence most of the time, sometimes not, but then, you know, then acting comes in very handy. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> then you do it. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. And, but the other thing that an institution or some kind of a, a sisterhood or a brotherhood or a filmhood gives you is people to phone. Because the people that you phone when you go, listen, I know, I don't have budget, but if we do this, then maybe the people who believe in you, the people that give you their time, the people that give you your faith, money can't buy you that, degrees can't buy you that, institutions can give you that though. And if you can't do that, you go find them in the groups, in the networking events, because that's how we all do it. Those people who's worked with me often, they know when I start sending you long voice notes, there's a real chance of budget. But when I send you that text, hey, listen, can I call you? They're like, oh, she's asking for a favor. <laughs> but it's the favors that got the films made eventually. 13 years. Who's taken 13 years to make a film? I never, ever, ever want to take 13 years to make a film again. But we did. And we opened that Encounters. And it was better than any wedding, including my own, that I've ever attended. Because <laughs> even my plumber was there, my electrician. Because mm. that's what it takes. Yeah. And that's part of the tools. And that's sort of, for me, it's community. It's community. Yeah. It's community. And it I'm comes in many shapes and sizes. Yeah. And so, speaking of community, 
how, how are you doing that work? Obviously, you do that work mm -hmm. in different communities. You talked about the coalition, but let's also jump uh, into building community, but also the kinds of stories that need to be told. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the, the outputs, and when it's a really critical output, but sometimes you forget about it from, from the programs I work in, is the network. But it's also the, the community and, and the feeling of, of being around your peers. Um, and for many years, you know, in Canada, I'd be the only black person at an event in the screen sector. I may be the only woman who wasn't white. Um, and I think also for a lot of the, the talents in East Africa, when you go to a lab in Europe, you're the only, like, you're the token African that went. So the way you can interact and engage with people and build networks isn't the same as if you're in a group where it's, it's just people from your community, just people from your region. Sometimes also people who speak your language. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to respond to that you were saying, I've had the experience in Canada that you have to, like when you're choosing a training program, you have to interrogate them, not just let them interrogate and interview you about what you're going to get, what you're going to take away. How will you access that network? Like, I'm a graduate of IAVE. We have a network online. I can log in in any country. I can find the person I want to co-produce with. And it's like Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. But not all institutions offer that. And I found the experience of training a lot of producers in Canada who went to university and have a master's in film, but they really understand like theory and art and have no business skills. So they have to come back into maybe the program I run with the National Screen Institute, uh, programs with the Canadian Film Centre, or they have to go to a more of a technical college and level up. So I think it's important to interview and understand like what are the skills you'll learn and take away, and is that what I need or do I have to complement it? Thank you. I think let's continue the conversation, mm -hmm. but let's jump into what is the impact of the training that you do on the broader community? How is it impacting the broader community? How is film and television education that you're doing, how do you think <coughs> it's impacting the broader community? Well, I mean, I hope that the stories that are being told represent broader communities and that the students who leave achieve um, their target audience, ensuring that they are not only reflecting and representing their own communities, but extending those into broader conversations and communities around them. One of the really big pluses of AFTA, and I can say this personally because I'm an alumni, is that it has a very broad alumni community and is extremely active in South Africa. And I don't like boasting, but it's broad and it's big and the alumni do really well. So in terms of the impact, I think it is linking in and servicing the broader community um, economies. So I'm making a film, I'm using you as a service provider, you're extending your service into this. So the work that we're creating is hopefully extending into broader communities and offering a sustainable way in which we can all benefit from it. Yes, telling stories is important. Yes, extending into your target audience is important, but what we want to do, I think, in South Africa at the moment is build sustainable economies so that we can continue extending into additional communities so that we can service where we are, but that that service starts extending out and has that ripple effect. And it really starts with the communities that you're in. And I do believe that we, as alumni, support each other and feed into each other's work. Now, how that could potentially feed into what Lemise is doing excites me. And, and how we can create opportunities of work, how we can offer internships, how we can enrich our students' lives into additional work that they're doing, and further mentorship, uh, fellowship, 
that's exciting, and I think that's where our conversations need to go, is that we're not alone in this. How can we extend into additional communities to strengthen allies and work, income, economies? Did that answer your question? I think so. Um, yeah, hopefully all the government agencies will put more money into film so that, you know, you we see, can do the funded. small business. Yeah, we're not funded. Yes. It's important to, to start where you are with yes. what you have. Exactly. And make that work, mm -hmm. right? I can't tell you how many times I've produced a theater show where no one gave me money. Mm -hmm. You know, no one said, hey, here's, you know. You had to hustle it out. Yeah, mm. or films or projects or whatever. And that's what we need to teach the youth mm. is don't expect anyone to give you anything. Mm. Create it. Great. Lamise? I think we, we impact is concerned. I can clearly say that for us, because we focused on small towns and, and rural communities, it's about giving the youth new avenues of income. Now, for city-based youth, um, that might be a different case. But if you're looking at a very small town where they don't have access to creative study, they don't have access to social media careers or digital media careers, for them, this is definitely a new income stream. And utilizing the mobile devices to form content that is sellable, that is a big tool that we, we harness. Um, because it means that for them who live very hand to mouth, they are able to film a video in the morning and sell it by the afternoon. Whether it be to a small business or the municipality or whoever for their social media. And I think that tool to be able to empower someone to put bread on the table that evening is very powerful and that's what we actually focus on. Um, just with regards to impact for industry, we launching um, at Fame Week, because we're the CSI <coughs> partner to MIF, we are launching the recognition of prior learning program. And this is specifically to um, look at the imbalance of professionals in our industry, who may be like myself as well. I was in TV for like 20 odd years, worked at SABC ETV, but you sort of started at the bottom and you worked your way up to produce a level. I didn't have the opportunity to do formal study. Now, there are countless amount of people in industry that have gone the same route, that maybe began working in the late 80s and now they've got 20 odd years of experience. We as Ikasi want to say, we've not only focused in the outside rural communities, but we now want to look at industry and say, we can assist you by taking you through a recognition of prior learning program. And we understand as a production crew, you don't have time to study. So there's another option. We can definitely RPL you to a full qualification. And if you would like to know more uh, about RPL, Natalie Delport Lowe, who is, if you maybe can just show your hand, um, will be having a session at four this afternoon. Um, where she will speak a bit more about the recognition of prior learning program that we're launching. Wow, that's very, very exciting. Um, I'm going to jump to you. Sure. Um, the question was about impact, right? Yes. What is the impact of the work that you do yeah, uh, I mean, on the broader community? I think it's not just the work that I do with my peers. It's the, the coalition of all the different things that are happening. And I think, you know, a lot has changed in the last three years, especially in Canada. We've realized that racism was a, th a thing, um, which is strange to me. I've always known that. Um, but it's because of, you know, training is a pillar. <laughs> Access to more money is a pillar. And in Canada, there has been more money that's been starting to come into communities of color and indigenous communities also policy change. So I think we're changing what shows up on our screens. There's a lot more stories, films, web series, TV series coming out of these communities that are now being broadcast, that are winning awards, that are being distributed outside of Canada. The fact that our Canadian delegation here is so diverse, mm -hmm. the fact that we even came to a market in Africa, this is the first time. So I think it's all of those things and it's about access to the skills and the funding 
and then the partnerships. And I think, you know, the work in East Africa, it's the same <laughs> pillars. We just don't have as much funding flowing into the region. So I think when the funding catches up, then the filmmakers will produce faster and not take 13 years like you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the plan, though. Yes, <laughs> it never it is. It never is. <laughs> um, I'd like to open the conversation up to the floor. Uh, do we have mics on standby? OK, we have mics on standby. Um, any questions from the floor? Any comments? If you can, please introduce yourself <laughs> and then ask your question. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Can oh, you hear me? Hold on, hold on. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me now? How about now? Can you hear me? There we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good morning. Uh, my name is Gabelo Maka. I am the creative director of Kevlo Studios. Uh, I think I've met you before, McKenzie. And I'm also the host of the Business of Animation podcast. Um, what I wanted to ask, actually, is, and maybe I should direct this towards Esther because. Hello. I've sent you some emails, we'll talk after. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what is it that the schools are actually doing to prepare the students um, to actually be able to monetize their skills? Um, I'm also an AFTA alumni. I went to the one in Cape Town and I did, excuse me, I did animation. And I remember when I did my fourth year, I felt like I, I was not prepared for industry. And so uh, now I'm, I am in industry working, do my own business, but what is it that the schools are doing to actually prepare the students to make money off of those skills? Sure. Um, what, what year did you finish? Uh, 2015. 2015 yeah. Yes, did you go up to honours? Yeah, I did honours in Joburg. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's a very, very good question. Thank you for answer, answering that. I think over the last couple of years, um, what we've really been trying to focus on is extending our, our idea of socialized learning, of project-led learning, and advancing that. So you would know, after is focused on socialized learning, we work in groups, we try and mirror the industry, we try and reflect the environment that the students might be able to work in, you know, collaboration, conflict resolution, all those 21st century skills. But what we've done in the last couple of years is we've really put that into overdrive. We're trying to force the students <coughs> into these forces, a hard word, encourage them into groups where they are working towards monetizing and upskilling their crews. And this we've done in various ways in the, in the way that we're teaching from first to second to third to fourth year is that when you're in animation, you often on the outskirts of where the group is functioning, where now we are really truly working that whole group in a unit and trying to make them understand how to monetize and how to work and how to get ready for the industry. Because what we're doing is we're reflecting that crew work um, into the industry. So yes, I hear what you're saying, but I'm hoping that in the last couple of years, our alumni will walk out going, we feel that doesn't matter what discipline we were part of, not producing or directing, any discipline is part of that, that crew that understands that we need to eventually make money out of this. We're also doing more broad-based in, the, in the, the start of the, and more two disciplines outcome later on. So you're getting this full broad spectrum of what is required of you and understanding of what your partner's doing. So maybe when you were a student, <coughs> and everyone in your crew understood what was needed from you, that collaboration into the end product and being able to then sell it would have incorporated you more. Does that answer I your question? Like to add something to sure, it. thanks so much, Uka. Yeah. Go ahead. So I just have to say something. So the, the bad news is you're never ever gonna be ready. No matter how much you studied, no matter how everyone told you about the business side of things, no matter if there is the ultimate school out there that gives you everything because at the end of the day it's about you right and tenacity and timing and a little bit of luck and things aligning talent is fab but guess what it's not enough being good is great having the degree yay it all helps but at the end of the day it's who wants to work with you 
and how you're going to get them to want to work with you. And sometimes it's going to be quick and things are just going to align and it's like the first kiss and it's like, yes! And sometimes it's disappointment after disappointment. There's going to be so many no's. You just need one yes. And that's what you're chasing. I'm going to jump in here. Most of my students come back in their <laughs> second and third year and they say, gosh, I wish I'd listened more. I wish I'd paid attention more when you were talking about the industry. So I think many of us attempt to do that, but students are not ready to hear that yeah. at that moment. Where their attention is, is in, I gotta learn this thing, I gotta get this assignment. And so that future feels too far away. Uh, I have quite a few of my current and some previous students in the room, uh, you know, who, who do call me to say, okay. Um, and, and even though we talk a lot, it's an ongoing learning, you know, it's, it's not a definitive thing. Uh, I'm sure all of us are continually learning in any event. Always. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Like, learning doesn't stop when you finish the degree or you finish the program. Like, I went back and did a producer's program a year ago. There's another program I'm going to go do in another two years because the industry is constantly changing. Technology is changing. So you can't just be like, I'm done, now I know everything and sit back. Excellent question. Thank you very much. We have another question. Please introduce yourself. A bit shy. Uh, can anyone hear me? Okay. Hold it a bit closer. Oh, okay. <laughs> How's this? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Talia. I'm an e-learning specialist, so I'm not in in the industry but I'm creating a course for children, uh, well, high schoolers to learn more about the industry before they get into it, per se. Um, so my question is, before like, you finish matric or, or anything like that, is it possible to like, collaborate a bit more on the high school spectrum so that maybe you can see whether you have an interest? Because most of the time when you talk about arts and culture, kids automatically think I can't sing or I can't, I'm not a public speaker, but there's so many other roles that are involved that they might not know about. And after matric could be a bit too late. So in that side of things, is there anything that can be done? I work for Africa Tikkun, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is there anything that can be done on that side of things? Who'd like to take that one? Could take it. Okay. Go I mean, ahead. just from an after perspective, pre COVID, we used to have uh, school workshops where students could come and spend an entire day running through our first year cycle. Like what it feels like to be in a crew, come up with an idea, you know, pitch that idea, make it, shoot it, put it out in the world, and kind of see what it looks like. Um, and that would potentially be a good thing to revisit. Unfortunately, we haven't taken it up after COVID again because so many other things have happened that have been super beneficial for business, right? Like the different ways in which we're engaging with students, but that's a definite way in which we could, as an institution, encourage engagement with the arts so someone can see whether they're interested or not. Lamise? Yeah, so we do it slightly differently. We buy... Um, we work via the municipalities in the areas, either the district municipalities or the local municipalities, and they have career days. So when the schools come through there, we just make sure that we have a stand, uh, we have some of our alumni from the area working that stand and explaining what the options are of study. Excellent. Um, anyone else wants to answer? Can we have another question? Oh, we have another question. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Kevin Jones, and I was hoping I could ask a question about the challenge of unstructured and unregulated training provided by what I would describe perhaps as politely fly-by-night training operators. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, Lamise is, is nodding wisely because <laughs> I... Uh, she, she's now registered with MICT CETA as a legitimate training provider and of course after registered with the Council for Higher Education 
and Seton also registered with, with the MICT CETA, but there are many fly-by-night training operators that deliver substandard training that, that follows no particular standard, and in many instances, the students that, that complete those study programs walk away with a certificate that is actually completely worthless. And so perhaps we could just expand on that and, and talk a little bit. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think I gave myself whiplash nodding. But <laughs> I think everyone or most of the people in industry have really good intentions and they would like to upskill the youth, especially um, later in the years when they're close to retirement. We all feel like we need to give back. However, what you said is a very important point. It is a little bit disruptive if there is a, an accredited training provider operating in that area because the students often get unaccredited learning. So they don't get credits towards the, the ID number and they walk away with a piece of paper that isn't really recognized, but they feel they did training. So it's a little bit of a false hope that you're giving. And what we'd like to say is, if you'd like to give back, rather contact one of the training providers. Let us do the foundational training, and we'll hand it over to you, and you can mentor as the filmmaker. Because that is also an important process, once the student has completed the training, that they go into a working environment or into a mentorship and learn from the professionals. Anyone else wants to answer that question or? I can maybe briefly comment. Okay. I mean, from, from previously being a funder, I, I made no friends by, by rejecting people that sort of were in this space. Like if you apply for money, and I think this is the same in training in any field, like you need to have done a needs assessment to say like, why is this skill lacking and needed? And how do I have the people who know how to deliver it and the right partners? And if it is a lab or a workshop, shop, are you working with an institution, a school, and also, are you not a private company? You know, you can't be a producer who decides on Wednesday night because I might get this grant, I'm gonna train screenwriters. It, this, this needs to be a thing that you're committed to, you've been doing, you have a track record, you have an approach. Um, and I think, at least in the Canadian side, because funders look at those things, it's, it's an issue, but it's maybe less of an issue. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions over here. David, and then I'll go to the back. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so my name is David Max Brown. Uh, full disclosure then, I work at AFTA. <laughs> <laughs> um, also been a film producer for a number of years and hope I still will manage to continue doing that. But I wanted to just talk about the fact that at AFTA, um, we do encourage students to actually form themselves like, you know, if you ask me what's the main reason to come to a film school, I'm gonna say it's the people you meet along the way, you know, and the relationships that you build. And you shouldn't just think that you're gonna bring your CV and the little film you've just done and go give me a job, but you might actually be able to create that job amongst yourselves and actually form a company while you're at school and think these are the people I'd really like to work with, you know? Uh, and we've seen that happen really well with some production companies or some groups of students that have formed really good happening production companies, you know? Um, but the other thing is that, you know, we're often thinking, oh, um, you know, film schools and the training is always at the sort of elementary getting into industry. And that is one of the things that I also do is like find places or relate to the industry. So people who need interns, I'm helping to place them and you know, relate to companies who have positions. But the other thing is that um, uh, uh, we have, and people don't think of AFTER in that way, but in terms of the postgraduate department, so in terms of the honors or the fourth year and also the master's course. And the master's course is growing in Johannesburg and in Cape Town, and we have some really wonderful, you know, very well established actually filmmakers who are coming onto the master's program. So I encourage anybody who's interested to talk to us about the master's program and how to get into it and uh, have some fun there making film, you know, making a long film um, and obviously doing the research and writing the thesis. So it's that always that mix of practical and theoretical, you know. Thank you, David. Um, at the back and then Christina. Uh, 
Hi, um, my name is Mbovu. Um, I consult for Africa Tikkun and I'm a freelance um, community worker and trainer. The thing is, uh, I want to talk more into the education and uh, what the gentleman was talking about. Is 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 easy said for for communities with privilege, because for example, for fees at after for your course. And I have a guy in Fuleni that wants the same course with the same fees. They can afford it. So when we talk education, we must talk in different stages because some applies to others and some doesn't apply to others. And when we say just like what education then um, gives you a privilege to, some can access it. Um, and then we have different ways of learning. There's an academic way of learning that everybody uh, does and does everybody say that's the best way of learning. Realistically, our systems of learning in um, South Africa work. They, 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 they actually teach most of the time to be part of that race. You know, they, they don't expand your view in terms of where you can do things differently, how you can create for yourself rather than working for someone else. Mm -hmm. And the excess, the 80% of, of education system, people who have access to that 80% are the ones that have the worst education. And then you have the elite, the, the one that can say, no, I want my child to focus on this and I can pay for that. So I think education here is <coughs> kind of like a, a, a touchy subject to talk about and which one is best, which one is not. And that's where we have this space for the fly-by-nights, mm -hmm. where they can come and say, oh, what they're giving you at after, I can give you in two weeks, but uh, you pay <laughs> 2,000 rand for that. Yeah. And I'm desperate, I wanna study, because education is the key to success, and then I end up there, and then I, I come with nothing. So um, the institutions that designs this, and the people that have a say in this must kinda like redirect and review how they do things, because Literally, we can't all afford it. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say, because, yeah. Thank you. And I think that's why on this panel, we, it's so interesting, because we have different models. We have the more formal private education. We have uh, one that is supported by Mixita, and people are supported to be on the program. We have people who go and do master classes. And Can I speak to that? You want to speak to it? Please. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I kind of, glossed over it earlier when I was talking about myself, but the reason I didn't go to film school was because I couldn't afford it. I was invited 15 years ago into the Canadian Film Center. I think it was like $10,000, but you had to be there full time, so I had to stop working. I couldn't do that, so I didn't go. Um, and I know I'm not the, the only person in that position in Canada, but I think, you know, in the last three years, a lot of stuff has changed. Um, a lot of the programs that I funded that have been running for years and years, we would say to them, we need to understand the diversity of who is taking your program. And if it's only a certain type of people, that has to be changed if you want the government money. Um, and I think even the program that I, I work with in Europe, they looked at who was participating and it was white Europeans. Well, how come there's Asian, there's black, there's indigenous producers in Europe. So they had to look at what were the barriers to access and how can we set those up so that those people have scholarships or other means to get into the program. And that's the same, the program I run in Canada for BIPOC producers, it's free. Because we know if we put a tuition on it, people couldn't afford. Thank you so much. Christina. Last question. No. Last question? Last question? Yeah. What's the time now? Mm. It's, almost, it's almost finished. Okay. Yeah, I have no uh, Christina? Microphone, please. Uh, we are wrapping up the session. If you have any any last burning questions, this may be the last question, but we might be able to squeeze one more in. Thank you so much, ladies, for a wonderful panel. Um, I think my question overlaps with the previous one and also with the discussion that's been had around the importance Sorry, of... Sorry, closer? Uh, the importance of networking um, and how crucial that is to uh, building creative communities and also building our economy. So my question overlaps with the previous one because it speaks to the fact that 
the economics of education often silos these alumni groups into the areas that they came from. So if your experience was at a private film school, then that's going to be your network. If you went to UCT, then that's going to be your network. Um, and I've kind of had a, a vast experience ranging from our, our public universities to a variety of um, private film schools. And the demographics are very different. And it's amazing to see such a wide offering for different levels of both education, income, etc. But how do we work to create networks between these silos so that we're not perpetuating those economic and cultural silos going forward? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uga wants to speak to yeah. it. Jump in, Uga. Great question. So I think it's important to remember at the end of the day, you also, everyone is free. You know, you don't have to just go to your AFTA group, right? You can, it's handy and you should. But again, these events, showing up, being aware of your industry, reading the trades, like your trades. So our trades would be NAVF, the organizations, IPO, DFA, festivals, encounters, Durban, there's applications that if you don't have the money, you can apply. It just, it's effort. It takes weeks sometimes to prep these applications. I hear, a, not you, but out there in the world, I hear so much moaning. Our country has got a lot on offer for filmmakers. So many opportunities. You want to go to AFM in America? Great, the NFF can help you, but you need to apply. And you can go get yourself a brand new network, but you need to wake up and do the work so I think there's so much opportunity in between the cracks, outside of the solid structures, which are amazing. By the way, thank you, awesome, wow. Like it's so inspiring to even hear, but this ain't it. But you also need to do, not you, I'm just generalizing. <laughs> the you generic need, you. You also like need to, to do the work. You need to read, you need to go, you need to do it. It's hard work, it's nonstop. You're gonna do 10 applications to get one. But what did I say earlier, you need one yes. You need one application, you meet that one person that opens 20 more people. But people need to stop out there moaning and groaning and fixating. And then if this doesn't work, go find something else because it's there and it's waiting for you. That's my advice. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really, and thank you for your question on tuition and, and you know, <coughs> the realities of Studying tertiary, it's expensive, right? And that's a whole conversation on its own. And it is a real struggle for private institutions. Like, we want to offer opportunities to, to other individuals that might not be able to study it after. So please, if, there are in, if there's partnership happening here, come talk to me, I'm here the whole day. But that's a long conversation, right? What adds to that conversation is exactly what you mentioned now is partnerships. We must understand that our students are full rounded human beings that are not only studying, they are struggling paying their accommodation fees, they are struggling eating and coming by. And I also think there's a misperception of the after student, right? I have many students that take care of their families while they're studying, while they're trying to put food on the table, while they, you know, and if we have more partnerships in the industry of, of education, I think a lot will happen. A lot of doors are gonna to open to students who want to participate in the institutions. And then finally, to add to your, your question is, internships, mentorships, that is where our industry collaborates with education. And that is where we get the integration between UCT and AFTA and Stellenbosch and, City varsity. and wherever. City Varsity, wherever you are. We need to ask industry to collaborate with us so that we can continue offering diverse opportunities, even if you don't study, for people to come onto a set and to work together. These are very complex and nuanced questions. They're great ones. They need a whole day's conversation on their own. But for me, it's about collaboration around an individual. It's not just the fees. It's about everything else that goes into the life of that student. Mental wellness. Mm. Let's talk for days. Let's talk. We have, we have things to talk about on that front. 
Lamise, do you want to do the last point? And then I'm going to close up. Sorry if you had your burning question. It's too late. Go, Lamise. So I just want to tag on to what you were saying. I think collaboration is key. And I definitely hear what you were saying. And even though we're doing sort of fundamental training out in the communities, we fit into a part of the learning pathway. And I think that's why we're here, to discuss and to network with other institutions. For your question at the back, we only do funded programs to rural and unemployed youth. So that is the sector that we operate in. It's a difficult sector because we're a non-profit organization and we are donor funded. So, you know, donors often don't understand what operational costs are for nonprofits and the challenges of rural students where the transport is concerned. Sometimes they live so far, we have to accommodate them for a period of three months, yeah. which isn't funded. So those kinds of collaborations are very important for us. And for us as ICASI, this is what we're appealing to industry for. Help us help the communities out there. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for your engagement and participation, and especially to our fabulous panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ladies. Yeah. Ladies, can we just take a quick photo? Mm. Yes. Oh, can you take a photo? Yeah. Just before you go, before yeah. you dash. Hello. We're just going to take a quick photo. <laughs> Where were you? Oh. <laughs>